Hi, hello, and welcome back to Science as Process and Perspective. So we've heard a little bit about my own story, how I got as a scientist into asking philosophical questions. We've also heard a little bit about what philosophy is, what science is, what knowledge is, and how philosophy and science interact to generate knowledge. I've told you a little bit last time how the way that philosophy and science um, were seen to interact has changed through history. They were never separate until quite recently. And then philosophy became sort of the handmaiden and later the judicial branch that justifies proper knowledge. I've told you a little bit about how philosophy is not and will never be a part of science. How this sort of excessive scientism of declaring everything a scientific problem is not a good way to go about looking at the role of science in society, in knowledge production. But on the other hand, how science is really an applied branch of philosophy, natural philosophy historically. And I was ending the last lecture by saying that in my opinion, what should be happening is that philosophy and science are used um, together, sort of a philosophical way of doing science is the best way. There's no clear demarcation. Scientific questions always have a philosophical aspect as well. So what we're gonna do next in this lecture is, is I'm gonna introduce what I call the standard view of science. This standard view of science is not an explicit, precise, and recognized philosophical doctrine. It is something, a bunch of ideas that occur in the heads of many researchers across disciplines. It's usually implicit, not really explicitly formulated. Some people hold some of these views, some of them hold others, some of them hold inconsistent views, some of them hold one set of views at one point, other sets of views at another point. They're just sort of in the background. They're not made explicit. One of the aims of this course is to make your own views on these points explicit. You don't have to follow my arguments. I want you to reflect and build up your own. So what I wanna do is I wanna sort of highlight those ideas that you may or may not be carrying around. And I want to emphasize how they are really limiting, restricting the scope and the power of science at this point how they are no longer tenable as a useful way to look at the philosophy of science. So before we dive into this topic, let's start as usual with a few questions. This time it's quite easy. They're just sort of agree, disagree, sort of multiple choice questions. So who would agree among the audience here with the statement that knowledge must be grounded in experience preferably reproducible evidence from experiments. Hands up if you do. Who would agree with the statement that there is a reality that exists independently of our minds, perceptions, opinions? Who would agree with the statement that there is a natural explanation to every observable phenomenon in the universe? Who would agree with the statement that reality is governed by laws? That is, general rules that can be understood rationally. Related to that, who believes that we can understand these laws completely and in full detail? And to complete a trilogy of questions here, who believes that scientific knowledge increasingly approaches such a complete understanding? And last but not least, and maybe somewhat surprisingly, who believes that scientific knowledge is a human social or cultural construction? You may have realized that each one of those questions denotes a sort of a specific stance towards science and scientific knowledge. There are different isms, so let's look at those isms. The first ism here, of course, is empiricism that holds that knowledge must be grounded in experience. You may have answered this question with, it depends, right? Because you could think of knowledge in mathematics or logic 
that is not derived from experience, maybe. We'll revisit this question in the next lecture. The next one about you know, reality is really a little imprecise. It is, of course, about realism. But if you're a realist, you not only believe that there is a reality out there that's independent of your mind, ideas, perceptions, and opinions, but also you believe that there is a method, probably the scientific method, that allows you to access that reality in some privileged way compared to other ways of pursuing knowledge or believing. Who would agree with the statement that there is a natural explanation for every observable phenomenon in the universe? This is naturalism, of course. It may seem a no brainer because if you're a researcher, you have already subscribed to methodological naturalism. You have basically signed up to provide naturalist explanations. You don't invoke magic, ghosts, supernatural entities, God or gods in your explanations. But having subscribed to that doesn't mean that you believe that there is nothing like that out there in the universe. You could just be studying that part of the universe that is accessible through naturalistic explanation. We'll come back to that. One, I mean, actually two big problems with naturalism. The first one is it is really difficult to say what a natural explanation is. And it changes, of course, that's the other problem, um, over historical time. Think of uh, astrology, which was a perfectly acceptable science until quite recently, actually, a few hundred years ago. Think of the ether, phlogiston, caloric, all these sort of scientific concepts that are no longer accepted as science. Vitalism was for a long time perfectly fine in science, no longer. Or think of other things like magnetism that mesmerized people just a few hundred years ago and it was now a completely normal and accepted part of physics. So what naturalism is, is sort of difficult, you know, to pin down and it depends on the historical context, which weakens it as a criterion for demarcation of scientific knowledge. The next three questions, of course, belong together. Reality governed by laws that we can understand uh, fully and completely. If you agree to those, then you're an objectivist realist. It'd be nice if we could just call this objectivism, but unfortunately this term was hijacked by Russian American writer Ayn Rand for her political ideology that is sort of assuming that there is a reality out there and that there's no problem with accessing it, but then uses that sort of knowledge to derive a purely ideological account of how informed egoism is the best way to organize a, so a society. Not a good thing. This is not what I mean here. So not objectivism, but objectivist realism, which is sort of the idea that the universe is lawful, entirely lawful and understandably lawful. And then coming in from left field is this idea that scientific knowledge is a human social or cultural construction. This of course is the doctrine of constructivism. And it's a really tough one as we will see because it's really hard to deny. But it poses problems. So if you said, I agree to both this question and the previous three, you hold an inconsistent view. But not to worry, you're not alone. There are lots of people with such inconsistent ideas. And hopefully by the end of this course, you will no longer hold those views. Okay, so let's get back. Having built up this sort of vocabulary of isms here, let's get back and look at what I call the standard view of science. It has three sort of foundations and we'll go through all of those in turn. But the main sort of foundation of this view is that it's objectivist realist. It says that the truth is out there. We can get at it using the scientific method. And this scientific method 
uh, make science a formal activity that accumulates knowledge by directly confronting the natural world. So it's sort of like an algorithm that we can use to get unbiased direct access to reality. Okay, that sounds good. And obviously this sort of view is founded in the philosophy of positivism that I introduced in last lecture as espoused by Auguste Comte in the 19th century. And he said, information derived from sensory experience interpreted through reason and logic forms the source of all certain knowledge. He combined empiricism, information derived from sensory experience with rationalism interpreted through reason and logic to come at this package. And the knowledge that we get is certain. We've entered the age of positive knowledge. That's what positivism means. Not that they were optimistic about the future or anything like that. Kant's philosophy was elaborated in the 1920s and 1930s by a group of people in Vienna. They called themselves the Vienna Circle. And this group consisted of mathematicians, scientists, and philosophers. It was founded by Moritz Schlick, among other people, and included philosophers such as Rudolf Carnap, Otto Neurath, but also people like Kurt Gödel, and at its periphery, people like Karl Popper and Ludwig Wittgenstein, who were not members of the circle, but interacted with it and were formed by it in many important ways. They came up with something they called logical positivism, also called logical empiricism sometimes. And it basically said, it took Kant's positivism to say that meaningful discourse is either analytic, so based in logic, mathematics, or empirically testable, as in the sciences. Everything else is cognitively meaningless. So they use philosophy in this sort of sense of a judicial branch of what is proper knowledge and what is not. And they say everything that is not analytic, not empirically testable, is meaningless. We'll revisit the distinction between analytic and uh, empirically testable knowledge, by the way, in the next lecture. This is quite radical. It means that all your sort of declarations of love or other sentiments, all your subjective impressions, all your gossip, all of that is meaningless. Seems a little harsh. And it is an extreme stance. So the aim here is to sort of declare all sort of ambiguity, everything that is problematic, basically declare it illegal. This sort of program culminated in the early work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, who in his famous book, Tractatus uh, Logico Philosophicus, declared that whereof I cannot speak, I must remain silent. Worüber man nicht sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen. What he meant is that if you can't express it in proper propositions, you cannot even think about it. It's not properly formed and it's not true knowledge. Wittgenstein actually thought that by writing this book, he solved all remaining problems of philosophy and he quit philosophy to became a terrible, terrible school teacher. But then through interactions with the Vienna Circle, um, he was coaxed back into to science, uh, into philosophy. He joined um, Bertrand Russell in Cambridge and in the second part of his career, basically reworked his entire theory of the philosophy of language into a much more sort of practical context-based context philosophy where the meaning of words is not given just like this, it comes out of what he called language games. This is the late Wittgenstein, a completely different philosopher from the early Wittgenstein. So here you have one man who contributed two really important things to philosophy, but they're mutually completely exclusive. But to come back from that digression to the Vienna Circle, this is a, a sort of a similar sort of move here. Okay, we avoid the problems um, of philosophy by declaring them unphilosophical. And so what the Vienna Circle did is it redefined the meaning of the term metaphysics from this branch of philosophy that looked at foundations, the foundations of being, the foundations of knowledge, etc. 
they replace that meaning with a, a sort of a, a very sort of um, bad um, implication that metaphysics is just abstract theory with no basis in reality. They weren't very fond of metaphysics and so it's useless. It's meaningless and we should not do metaphysics. This all came out of a sort of an observation historically that science, the sciences were making amazing huge steps of progress. You have to think that these people were working at a time where relativity, quantum mechanics, all these kind of revolutions happened. While philosophy seemed to be stuck in metaphysical speculative disputes. So the Vienna Circle con con you know, claimed that scientific theories are built up by the logical manipulations of observation. So what are the kind of statements, propositions that we can actually ground in reality and how do we do this? And for this, Schlick and Carnap came up with what they called um, the, the principle of verification. And it's based on the observation or on the statement that scientific theory is based on condensed summaries of observation. So you have to be as clear as possible when you describe something. These summaries consist of what they call protocol sentences, short and clear sentences that only contain observational terms that are defined ostentatiously or ostensively in an obvious way. So basically your definition and ostentative uh, definition is when you can point at something and say, this is what I mean. And here is of course where the problems already begin. So Bertrand Russell, for example, pointed out that there are only two words in the English language that are defined this way. And they are this and that. Those two words imply whatever you're pointing at at the time. But any other noun, let's take unicorn, for example, is not denoting anything directly. A unicorn, for example, what is it denoting? Unicorns obviously don't exist. So, so is there something out there that subsists in a weird way? So a semi sort of shady existence? Or as Russell said in his uh, theory of descriptions, is a noun like unicorn is not a, a, an ostentative sort of directly denoting sort of thing, but rather it's a description of something like a unicorn that has the properties of a unicorn. Okay, so if I point at the wall behind me here, I'm pointing not at a wall directly, but at something that has the properties of a wall. And, and what those properties are, of course, is a matter of debate. It's very complicated. We'll come back to that in a minute. So this is one problem. So this, you know, I mean, there, there are more problems with this, this principle of verification. Another criticism came from, from a member of the Vienna Circle um, itself, Otto Neurer. And he said, what counts as a basic observation, what qualifies as a protocol sentence is defined conventionally based on assumptions and previous knowledge, just like the wall I pointed at before. I have to know what a wall is before I can point at it in the first place. Gregory Bateson says, you know, uh, information is a difference that makes a difference. So we have a world out there that has, has no differences in it, but we point out differences that make a difference to us. So meaning comes out of the interaction of the subject and the object, but this is not happening here. They say, okay, we can point to objects and these objects, they are ostensibly defined, they exist out there. And these protocol sentences, they connect us to those uh, objects out there. So basically by making the observation, by stating um, the observation through those sentences, that's the same as actually having the experience of um, perceiving those objects. And this was criticized by Neurath who said, you have all kinds of previous knowledge, okay? And we'll get back to that problem when we talk about Willard von Norman Quine and his idea of knowledge always being theory laden. So there are real problems here um, with verification. And so Neurath came up with this very um, fabulous and famous metaphor, which is called Neurath's boat. He said, we are like sailors who must rebuild their ship on the open sea without ever being able to dismantle it in dry dock and reconstruct it from its best components. We cannot just reboot our perception. 
our perception is always colored by preconceptions, assumptions, previous knowledge. And so we're constantly rebuilding our boat. Now this already caused a few problems for the verificationists here, but um, much bigger trouble were just around the corner. And they came in the form of um, Austrian philosopher Karl Popper, um, that, who not always looks like the emperor from Star Wars, like in this picture. And he completely refuted verification. So he had a very close look at this, this sort of claim that, you know, you can use reason and logic on sensory experience to verify certain knowledge. And he said, this is simply not possible because it's based on a logical fallacy. So the problem with verification is that it is based, it leads to uh, the fallacy of affirming the consequence. It's also called the confusion between necessity and sufficiency. And it works like this. So verification works like this. You say, if P, then Q. And because Q exists, therefore P. What does that mean? So let's substitute um, P with it rains. If it rains, then Q, the street is wet. And the street is wet, therefore, it rains, it must be raining. So here you see the problem. This problem is underdetermined. There could be other reasons why the street is wet. For example, somebody could have, you know, there could have been a broken pipe. Somebody could have hosed it off. There could have been snow earlier and it's melting now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It could have rained earlier and it's not raining now. So the fact that the street is wet does not mean it's raining. This is an example of the fallacy of affirming the consequence. And this is what happens when you try to verify some piece of knowledge with evidence, okay? There could always be an alternative explanation. However, the opposite of this, okay? The opposite of this argument works. It is called modus tollens or denying the consequence. It goes like this. If P, then Q, but not Q, therefore not P. If it rains, then the street is wet, but the street is not wet, therefore it does not rain. This is a perfectly valid form of logical argumentation. So Popper says in his famous book, Conjectures and Refutations, the source of scientific conjectures is mysterious. So the hypotheses that we formed I don't know where they come from and he doesn't really care. But if a conjecture is not falsifiable, it is not scientific, okay? A theory that explains everything explains nothing. Famously, he criticized Sigmund Freud's theories of psychoanalytic theories as being completely unscientific because they are not refutable. So here you have a principle of falsification instead of verification that is logically sound, unlike verification, and can lead to a sort of a, a improved knowledge by um, refuting invalid hypotheses. So science is seen as a sort of a sequence of conjectures and refutation. But this leads us with a problem. Of course, this kind of knowledge is always tentative. So you could say, if you have a hypothesis that has not been refuted, although it has been tested many times, we can have more and more confidence that it is true. Popper calls this very similar to, or truth likeness. But the problem with that is that you could always have this one piece of evidence that comes and completely refutes it. So actually it is a fallacy to think that a theory that has been tested many times and not refuted is more solid than a theory that has only been tested once. So good scientific theories are those that resist stringent efforts to refute them, but this doesn't really work because it doesn't really tell us anything about whether those theories correspond to anything in reality. So interestingly enough, Popper is not a realist, okay? If you think it through, 
his scientific theories, they don't correspond. They are not verified in evidence, but they are only refuted if the evidence is against them. That's only one problem with falsificationism. Other problems are that it's, it's rarely the case that we just um, refute a theory without a valid alternative. So if you can give me an example of a theory that is refuted without us having any alternative, then please do, because I don't know of any. And so it comes that often theories that have been thoroughly refuted are, are, are just, you know, they keep on being used, they keep on existing. For example, think about rational choice theory in economics. So the idea that um, economic actors are rational um, agents, it doesn't work, we know it doesn't work. And yet people use it over and over again in economic models because nobody has a more realistic, generally accepted model of how people work because it's very difficult to model the behavior of people in detail. The same applies, for example, to quantitative genetics and the idea of a linear map between the genes and the phenotype. We know that these maps, you know, the interactions between genes are important. There is no such linear mapping correspondence between genes and phenotypes. And yet we use these linear models and keep on using them in genome-wide association studies and other things. Although we know they are wrong, they have been falsified over and over again. But since we do not have a more realistic map for most of the genotype phenotype maps, we keep on using them. So even if you don't understand the details of these scientific discussions, you can appreciate that we rarely refute something without a valid alternative. Another problem is pointed out by uh, Duhem and, and uh, Quine, who said, you know, hypotheses are rarely judged in isolation. They are based on all kinds of sort of uh, a web of beliefs, auxiliary hypotheses. And instead of refuting um, a hypothesis, we often just build around it. Think about the geocentric worldview and, on, and the deference and epicycles that people build uh, to, in the, into the model to, to um, explain retrograde motion of, of planets they still were able to predict the position of planets perfectly well. And in fact, if you think about it, a positivist couldn't distinguish between the geocentric and the heliocentric um, uh, model because they both make the same predictions. One is just more elegant than the other, but the reasons for this are unobservable, okay? So positivists can't actually say anything about it. So if you, uh, so, so the, the problem was that the, the geocentric worldview was not refuted, but it was sort of padded with all these auxiliary um, hypotheses to fit the obser um, observational data. And we could be doing this in all kinds of other areas of science. So this view, falsificationism is a huge step forward from verificationism. It shows that verificationism is based on a logical fallacy. This is an example of a philosophical um, sort of progress where you can no longer be a verificationist in the old sense that the, the people from the Vienna circle were. It just doesn't work. It's fallacious, it's wrong. And so um, Popper killed that, but by doing that, he replaced um, uh, positivism with a really weird sort of uh, instrumentalist um, philosophy of science that leaves us in a void when it comes to the truth value of our theories. And also is, hugely oversimplified when it comes to explaining actual way in which science is done. And yet it is still very much among us. So if people know any philosopher of science, if researchers know any one philosopher of science, it's usually Karl Popper. So falsificationism is really important. So, so let's summarize this part of the talk. Um, logical positivism and falsificationism both see science as a formal relation between theory and data. That's very important. So the standard view of science is sort of a formal algorithmic way of, of connecting theory with evidence. Both see science progressing steadily towards objective truth. One of them by verification, by grounding it more and more in evidence. The other one by refuting more and more um, untenable hypotheses. But what about social and political aspects of doing science? As I just said, Popper's view of science is hugely oversimplified. The actual way of doing science is much more complicated. So what's happening there? Are these real world happenings, are they important? And in what way? And so the third pillar of the standard view of science after logical positivism and falsificationism 
is the sociology of science as stated by Robert Merton. So Merton as a sociologist belonged to a school of sociology, which is called structural functionalism, which ex examines institutions and society and what um, they provide as a structure, what kind of function they provide to society as a structure. And he said, the institutional function of science in particular is to provide certified knowledge, knowledge we know we can trust. The institution of science is there to produce this kind of trustworthy knowledge. And so he was interested in um, sort of um, how this structure, the institutions of science, structure the norms of scientific behavior. So these structures impose specific behavior that needs to be adhered to. So as a scientist, you need to behave in a certain way to produce certified trustworthy knowledge. And he called this the ethos of science. It's not quite the same as the ethics of science. Ethics of doing science is a personal thing. You have to stick to the rules, but this is a societal thing, a structural thing. Institutions are structured in a way that they guarantee the production of certified trustworthy knowledge. So scientists who conform to this ethos are rewarded while violations of the ethos are sanctioned. And this is how science can provide its societal function. More specifically, the ethos of science contains these four principles. The first one is universalism, okay? It's very important that the criteria to evaluate claims, scientific claims do not depend in any way on the person making the claim, on their background, on their class, on their cultural background, um, their race, gender, anything, okay? It must be completely universal, humanity. Any sort of um, rational being should be able to, to participate in science. The second one may be rather surprising for an American sociologist working in the 1960s, and, it, and he calls it communism. Um, but that means nothing else but scientific knowledge is commonly owned, it's shared. You may claim um, to be the originator of a certain scientific um, theory, but once it's out there, it's published, everybody can use it and develop it in ways that you have no control over. That is very important. And that, of course, is at the core of open science uh, today. Disinterestedness. Scientists must disengage their interests from their judgment and actions. So your judgments and actions should not be colored by your personal interests. Okay. So this also, this allows, of course, um, any sort of biasing of, of cherry picking of data and outright fraud, of course. And the fourth principle here is organized skepticism. This is very important. Scientific communities should disbelieve and criticize new views until they are firmly established. So science is at heart a very conservative business. You should disbelieve anything new until it is thoroughly, thoroughly established. And even then keep on challenging it and challenging it and challenging it. Okay, so Merton said, this is the ethos of science. If those four criteria apply, then we get a functioning sort of science, scientific institutions and we get the production of certified trustworthy knowledge. So great, okay, sounds good, right? Um, so to summarize, we now have societal structures that implement the, the sort of standard um, view of science and philosophy, okay? So there are social norms and there are cognitive norms that are sort of the ones provided by positivism and falsificationism. The standard and norms um, are the source of the authority and success of science. Basically, they um, are the reason that scientific knowledge is different from other kinds of knowledge and that people in society so far have accepted this. Although, as we know, science is increasingly coming under attack, not just uh, from left and right, uh, postmodernism and um, denialism, creationism, all this kind of stuff. Following those norms leads to certified knowledge, which gets us close to objective truth. So if you apply these, this recipe, this algorithm properly, you will get certified knowledge, no matter what society you are, no matter what time in history you are in. And the standard view is an account of how science should be. That's important. A theory of an ideal science. All of it is highly idealized. And it's not really how science works.
So for the rest of this course, we will be looking at criticisms of this view that come from, if you want, almost empirical study of how science actually works, but also philosophical arguments that show that this is a hopelessly naive and, and sort of unsophisticated way of, of looking at science. I'm sorry. Okay, so we could call this naive realism. And this naive realism really has a bad influence on how science is done. It leads to all kinds of things that are unintended. And so we'll talk about these things in the next few lectures. The first topic we will tackle is this idea of certain knowledge. In the standard view of science, if you adhere to the rules, you get certified knowledge. What does that mean? Certified, trustworthy, certain? And that will be the first thing we examine in the next lecture. I hope you tune in again and you enjoyed this one. See you again next time.